You're watching CNET, the digital domain. Plus, how to get internet access for life and what exactly is a firewall. And we'll head out traveling on the best of the web and show you how to get your feet to do the mousing right now on CNET Central. Now, from the number one on-air and online information source for the digital age, this is CNET Central. Hi, I'm Richard Hart. And I'm Gina St. John. Welcome to CNET Central. America Online is the world's largest online service, one of the most popular ways to access the net. Since October, membership has jumped more than 12%, and usage has nearly tripled to an average of 4.3 million hours online a day. AOL's new flat rate all-you-can-use pricing plan is credited for much of the growth, but it may also be to blame for a growing list of troubles. Yeah, system crashes, frequent busy signals, and spotty customer service are all common complaints, and a half dozen class action lawsuits accuse AOL of offering service it can't deliver, namely online access. We sent reporter Justin Gunn to find out how the company plans to fix the problems and keep the customers happy. America Online's billion dollar success can be credited almost entirely to you. That is, if you're one of its 8 million members. But with success comes competition. And to keep up with competitors, AOL recently offered unlimited internet access for just $19.95 a month. And that sounds pretty good. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of people thought. So many, in fact, that the system has become overloaded. So now, instead of unlimited access, it's becoming a little bit more like unlikely access. Every time I've tried it at home, about a half a dozen times, I haven't been able to get through. It's been uh, kind of a hassle. First of all, I'm, I'm sorry they can't get online. It's not what I want to happen. I want them to be able to dial a phone one time, hear it ring, hear that awful modem sound, and get on AOL and, and be happy. But for David Gang, AOL's Senior Vice President of Product Marketing, trying to keep the subscribers happy is just one of several problems he's faced since offering the new pricing plan. Recently, AOL has gone through tremendous growth. Number of subscribers has increased. The amount of time that subscribers spend online has increased. Why not increase capacity before the new pricing plan? I think the decision was get it to people as fast as we can, grow the system as fast as we can. You know, and people are working long hours to try and make it happen. So I, th I think it was the absolute right thing to do. But some critics like Robert Seidman, editor of NetGuide magazine, think AOL should have been better prepared for this onslaught of new members. I think that they knew what was going to happen. Um, I think they knew that there would be an influx. I think that they also knew that they would not be able to support it, that they knew that the problems that are going on they would be able to handle, but that they figured that they can, they can get through this. Even beyond the hassle of not getting through, some subscribers are even running into billing problems. I have here a credit card statement from my boss, actually, who was on a $4.95 a month plan and wanted to stay there and, and said that he clicked the button to stay there. And it says 1995. He was billed for the new plan. For the entire month of November, we highlighted the new pricing plans all over the service. And then in December, when you signed on, you got a pop-up to make a choice. And you could choose 495 or 995. And something happened where that didn't take. And so our plan is, as soon as members call up and say, this isn't right, we fixed their credit card bill. To counter these problems, which have led to class action lawsuits by some of its members, AOL's come up with quick solutions. First, putting an extra $100 million towards network expansion, then cutting back on marketing, and finally pleading with users to spend less time online. But some industry analysts note that trying to sustain member longevity and keep up with competition can prove a difficult balancing act. They're getting a lot more competition from a lot of different areas, so they need to offer the flat rate pricing, but at the same time, they've got to be careful not to max themselves out so that they alienate people, not only from AOL, but from the Internet. So what is AOL's outlook for the future of access? Our goal is so when people come into AOL this summer, that, they, that this is history, and, and that's, that's going to be a challenge. For CNET Central, I'm Justin Gunn. That's assuming there will still be subscribers this summer. A recent News.com reader poll found that only about a third of folks think AOL's unique content is worth sticking it out with the service. Meanwhile, other Internet service providers are taking advantage of the online king's crisis, inviting disgruntled AOL members to quit and sign up with them. 
Cookies, they're popping up all over the internet these days. Now we're not talking Oreos and chocolate chip. These are the kind that store information about you in your own computer. Here to explain is our own reporter, Hari Srinivasan. And Hari, first, tell us exactly what is a cookie. Well, Gina, it's a real simple concept. Basically, it's a way for a website to store pieces of information about your browsing tastes and preferences on your hard drive. Common examples are sites that require a name and a password to gain access. You type the information in once, and then the next time you visit that site, you don't have to re-enter it. Now, there are other reasons and uses for these cookies, right? There certainly are, and they're raising a bit of controversy when it comes to a user's privacy. Websites can not just save information regarding your preferences, but information regarding you. Those are the types that have companies like Pretty Good Privacy and people like Mark Elrod concerned. People shouldn't have the right to collect information you know, about you without your permission. You know, you should be given notification and you, know, you should be allowed the chance to give consent. The information he's talking about is the type most sites are starting to require these days. If the site has a cookie set on your machine and you fill out a form with personal information such as your name, address, phone number, email address, they are then able to say, okay, now this cookie and this, this profile is associated with this actual person. And websites are using these ID markers to start tracking individuals and their surfing habits within a site. Information that helps distinguish visitors to a site can be worth a great deal in marketing and advertising dollars. Cookies is actually a really good way to say this is, you know, this stream of clicks uh, through the website is one person. This other stream of clicks through the website is this other person. Brian Balendorf ought to know. He's the chief technology officer for Organic Online, a web design firm whose clients include some of America's largest companies. He says advertisers can use information about a person's surfing habits to help target ads to them better. If I have expressed an interest somehow in wanting to get information about computers, you know, I'm probably much more likely to respond to an ad for you know, a new Pentium Pro than, than somebody who's already bought a machine and isn't really in the market for one. But there is a new trend on the horizon, a way for the same technology to begin tracking your surfing habits between sites. Now, since a cookie can be attached to just about any file on a page, it can also be attached to an ad banner, which may be served from a company other than the site you're visiting. For example, if you were to check your cookies file, you may find one from DoubleClick.net, an ad vendor who's sending you a cookie through an ad, regardless of which site you actually visit. So let's say you visit one site with an ad banner served from DoubleClick. They can place a cookie that identifies your computer. If you go to a different site with an ad being served by DoubleClick again, your ID remains the same. But now they have the information on two sites that you went to. This information is being passed uh, behind the user's back without them knowing uh, that all this marketing data is being collected. That's why PGP is coming out with their latest product called the Cookie Cutter, a filtering software surfers can use to reject cookies or select the ones they don't mind receiving, but most importantly giving them, the surfer, the option to make the choice. Most browsers have a feature where you can elect to be notified when a site is attempting to place a cookie into your computer. But if you surf on any regular basis, this feature can get pretty old pretty fast. Don't forget, most sites use cookies for nothing more than personalizing your web experience. For example, CNET's own news.com uses cookies to let you customize the news you read. So they aren't all bad by any means. But still, what if I would like to erase all this and I go and I delete the cookies.txt file on my computer? Well, you better plan on doing that about every day or so because the sites which set cookies are very persistent. They'll keep trying to put the cookie onto your page when they see that the previous ones are history. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Hari. If you'd like to know more about cookies or the software that Hari mentioned, you can find it all at CNET.com. Now, don't go away because when we come back, a sneak peek at the hottest high-tech nightclub to hit the map, a virtual venture from Steven Spielberg. And if you're looking for adventure, head out on the highway. We go traveling on this week's Best of the Web.